Let's get started. Thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat box, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Samantha Oakley from ALA's Public Programs Office. I am pleased to introduce today's webinar, Size Doesn't Matter, Transforming Big Ideas into Small Library Environments. Uh, before we start, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office with support from ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. To learn more about the Cultural Communities Fund or make a contribution, please visit ala.org ccf. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and online learning library full of free webinars just like this one. Uh, finally, a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenter has microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments in the chat box. To send a chat message, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click chat. If you have any technical issues, please use the Q&A window uh, to communicate with ALA staff. To send a message through the Q&A feature, move your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom window and click Q&A. Please do not put any uh, technical questions in the chat window as they could be missed if that window is very busy. Uh, we will respond to your technical collect questions as quickly as possible. Note that this session is being recorded, so if you would like to view any of the information uh, afterwards, you may do so via the archive version, which will be sent out later today. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for this afternoon, Marianne Mori. Marianne has presented on a variety of topics at several national library conferences, including ALA, ARSL, ALSC, PLA, and the Internet Librarian. She has also been published numerous times in professional journals and books, writing about such topics as teen services, library volunteers, job-related stress, and programming. Marianne is currently a library consultant for the State Library of Iowa. She completed her MSLIS from the University of Illinois in 2006. We first saw Marianne present at the 2018 conference of the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, or ARSL, our favorite place to learn about many of the exciting things happening in small and rural libraries across the country. ARSL's 2019 conference will be held next September in Burlington, Vermont. It's definitely worth a trip if you're able to attend. And with that, I'll turn things over to Marianne. Thank you, Samantha. And let me get my slides up here. Just a moment here. There you go. You should be seeing the slides, I assume, right? Okay. Well, thank you for having me here today and thank you for joining me. Uh, one question we didn't ask is, did any of you get snow? And uh, Samantha and I were talking earlier, I said small libraries, that means that you, your director and other staff are probably the ones out shuffling snow if you did get the snow. So we got hit pretty hard here in central Iowa. So it's nice that we're doing this webinar um, online, that nobody had to travel in the snow. As Samantha said, I'm a consultant with the State Library. We have several consultants on staff, but six of us serve as district consultants, meaning we're out in the field. In my district, I have um, 106 libraries with the branch locations, 99 uh, libraries with 106, uh, including the branches. And there are some, a lot of small ones in my district. In our state, we have 544 public libraries. And out of those, 47% serve populations of less than 1,000 people. So we do know about small libraries here in Iowa. And I know um, it was interesting to see your sizes that you were mentioning as, as we were discussing before we started here. And I'm going to talk about that in just a little bit, uh, mention something that I noticed as you were putting in your numbers. This session was originally presented for the state of Iowa, and I presented it with three other librarians. And you can see their pictures here and the names of their libraries, as well as the population sizes that they serve. Uh, believe it or not, the person in the lower right hand corner, uh, Colleen, serving Story City Library with a population of 3,400, that's moving toward a mid sized library in Iowa. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about when well, we're talking about small. I know some of you are from a few larger size libraries, considerably larger, but I think you'll find some information here that will apply to you because. Uh, as I'll probably mention later, a lot of the challenges that small libraries have also exist in big libraries. 
So here's the direction we're going. I'm going to give just a little bit of background about what small actually means and share some, some articles with you and then look at some suggestions and ample uh, examples and then I'll have some application and be asking you to think a little bit about application, share some resources and of course we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So one thing that we do at the State Library, which I'm guessing your State Library does as well, is after any kind of educational offering, we do a survey and ask for some feedback. And on one particular occasion, we had done some summer reading training, a live presentation, and some of the feedback we got was this. Uh, that library has money, and they can do that, but I can't. Or that library has a lot of staff. I work by myself, so I can't do that or that library's big, they've got all kinds of space, and I don't, so I can't do that. And, and we just kept hearing that over and over. So what we have tried to do in our training is to show ways that you can take ideas from larger libraries and implement them into smaller ones. So that's what I'm hoping to do for you today is to eliminate this word can't from your vocabulary when it comes to talking about library services. I have to share this story because it was such a good illustration Coming from a non-library person, I was sharing with a friend a few weeks before this presentation about what I was doing, that I was prepping for this presentation about big services and small libraries, and he very innocently asked, well, what's the difference between big and small? I have two dogs, one's big and one's small, and they both bark. I thought, what a great lesson that is, because regardless of your library size, small or big or in between, all of our libraries can bark. They can all serve the populations and serve them well um, in our communities. This is another good quote that came out of a 2004 article from American Libraries. Small is not the same as less. So now I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to try to keep an eye on the chat box here. What's the difference between small and less? What's, what's it mean that small is not the same as less? Looking for some answers to come through here. How is small different from less? And Carrie, you're so right. We still have the same responsibilities as larger libraries. Small doesn't mean a lack of programming and you can still have engaged patrons. Oh, Lynn, good. Customers still have the same expectations regardless of the size of your library, right? and small is still important. Yeah, good comments. And um, Tanya, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, we are just as important in our communities. And, and I say that all the time about the small libraries I serve. It's just amazing what they're doing in their small communities with their small spaces, small staff, small budgets. And you're right, Melanie, less gives more of a negative connotation, doesn't it? Impact on children that our library may be small but can still have an impact. Great comments, and you're all absolutely on target there. Well, let's see if I can get my slides to advance here. There we go. Uh, some of you may remember this cartoon character, Mighty Mouse. He was small, but he was mighty. And so that's kind of the pattern and the thought process that we're going to maintain today throughout this session. There's an article titled, A Small Library with Big Ideas, and it was published in 2014, and I'm going to look at my notes for this because I want to quote uh, what the author said. The author was the director of the Myrtle Library in Missouri. Perhaps some of you are from Missouri and are familiar with this library. This library has 632 square feet, so it's tiny. And the entire county in which this library is located has 10,000 people. So one thing that this director in this article points out is that we are 25 miles from the nearest red box, two hours away from the nearest Barnes and Noble, and we're the only publicly accessible broadband within about 25 miles. So that's one advantage of being a small library is that you're it. Everything else is so far away. And so it's important that you are giving the most that you can to your community. And this author goes on to say, the library along with the post office and the gas station are where people come together to talk about everything from the weather to local elections, news, and where to get hay. And I'm sure that many of you in, in very small communities can relate to that. This is another uh, quote in a um, photo from that article, actually. The 
director says, most recently I added a puppet theater for the kids and we're working with our regional office of the Missouri Department of Conservation to start a fishing pole and tackle loaner program next month. They're located near a river. So keep in mind that these programs and activities are being done in 632 square feet. She adds that it's a pleasure to work in a library so small that I know all my patrons by name and what they like to read for the most part. So that's definitely an advantage of being small. You do know your patrons. So being small cuts both ways. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages. This coming from that 2000 article I mentioned earlier. What would you say are some advantages to being small? Type your comments here in the chat box. What are the advantages? It's always easy to talk about the disadvantages, but let's think positively here today. What are the advantages of being small? Being personal with your patrons, absolutely. And that's what that author in the article mentioned too. Focused and streamlined programming. Oh, staff brings you snacks, that's true. <laughs> People will help when needed, yeah. Not as much of that chain of command that you have to jump through hoops, right? You can be much more uh, flexible and with personalized service. Definitely. Good comments. Well, these are a few advantages that um, the author notes in that 2004 article. Uh, people still know what's going on in the world. Just because you're in a small community doesn't mean you're, you're living as a hermit. Your connections can be made quickly. Your institutions that are in town are usually quite interro interwoven because you're so dependent upon each other. So that makes it very easy to collaborate with um, maybe the, the law enforcement or with uh, your public works. And if somebody has a good idea, it doesn't take months of preparation to get it on the table. And I think that's really a, a definite plus in being in a small environment. For the uh, practicalities of time limitations today, I'm going to focus on three areas of focus and, um, and talk about how small libraries fit into these, these aspects. The first is programs and then building spaces and maker spaces as you see here. So programs, sometimes these can be tricky in small libraries and a lot of our small libraries here in Iowa don't have a meeting room. And so it, it's, it's cramped even in the space that they have. What are some other challenges that you've noticed in programming aspects in a small library? Challenges in doing programming specifically. Budget, yeah, Donna, you're so right. Funds, Chelsea says. Ah, noise, Carrie, yes, because if you're small, even if you're doing something over in a, a side area, it, it usually carries because you're so small. Trying to cover the desk at the same time, most likely you're probably working by yourself. Yeah, several of you are mentioning staffing. Somebody else is using the meeting room. You know, a lot of what you are saying also happens in large libraries because I've worked in small libraries, I've worked in large libraries. And even in large libraries, they may have big buildings, but their budgets are tight too. And in one particularly large system that I worked in, my programs were all held in the public meeting space and that room was often booked a lot. And even though the library took precedence, if somebody had booked it before me, I was out of luck. So I had to juggle my programs around the meeting room usage. Um, and even in large libraries, staffing sometimes is a problem just because there are that many more responsibilities to go around. And then with budget cuts, a lot of staff is being cut. So don't think that just because you're small that you're unique to these kinds of problems. Even the big libraries have these kinds of problems. Staff money space, time to prepare. Here's some solutions to some of that and I'll go into some of this a little bit more. Um, utilizing volunteers or do-it-yourself activities as far as um, trying to compensate for lack of staff. As far as budget cuts, rely on donations or go craftless. I sometimes sound like a renegade librarian when I say you can do a story time without crafts. And in fact, I have very successfully done that and just talked about this yesterday in a webinar we did here in Iowa for summer reading that craftless is perfectly acceptable. Don't think you have to do that every single time. As far as space, try going off-site, doing it right in the stacks, which is what you see in this picture here on the screen. They just moved a front table and they're doing their program smack dab in front of their circulation desk. And it's working because that's the only space they have. Uh, and then utilizing volunteers to help with some of that preparation. In one library where I worked, 
we had a couple of retired preschool teachers who would come in and it became a social time for them to volunteer together and they would cut out and do prep work for some of the crafts in that library which which hadn't gone craftless yet here's another interesting thing i mentioned do it yourself this is a library that's considered mid-size here in Iowa. Their population is around uh, just under 18,000, but growing. And they have done a do-it-yourself story time. And you're probably asking, oh, what, how do you do a do-it-yourself story time? Well, I asked their children's librarian that very question. And I'm having trouble advancing my slides here. And here's what she sent to me. This is a photograph of their do-it-yourself story time, and I'm just going to read what she told me. Uh, the weekend story time has worked well for us, and they only do this on the weekend when they're uh, not utilizing as much staff. We gather picture books, easy readers, nonfiction, and board books for a theme. We place them in a basket with a stand-up letter telling about the books and asking families to read together. There's a craft to do that goes along with the theme. I will have to tell you about last Saturday, says this children's librarian. I was working, and a little gal who comes to weekday story time came to the library with her dad. She asked, Miss Diana, are you going to have story time? I informed her that I was not. However, there was do-it-yourself story time. Her dad then said, Daddy will do story time today. I just think that's a great story that of um, the dad getting involved because sometimes that, that's hard to do in our library. So here was a father bringing his young child to the library and together they were going to do their own story time uh, utilizing the resources that the library had already put on display for them. This is uh, from an article, actually, uh, I believe this was a blog, uh, with information from the Texas Library Association, and I know we have somebody here from Texas, I saw that earlier. This is about tale tellers, also known as when teens read. Um, and again, I'm going to read from this because it was such good information and I, I can't explain it as well as the article did. Said this program addressed a core problem, difficulty providing story times with chil for children with limited staff. The librarian's solution was simple, recruit teen volunteers from the community to provide the story times. This not only led to hundreds of children being able to enjoy story times in their library, but it served the additional purpose of empowering teens. And what this library did was they first gathered the teens and then they met with the students and their parents to stress the importance of what they were doing. And they hired or recruited someone to train those students in storytelling techniques. Um, I'm hoping that they also auditioned the teens before they, they let them loose in a room of preschoolers uh, but I think this is a wonderful opportunity to give your teens some leadership capabilities and to uh, add to your staff aspects. So let's move on now and talk about space considerations in small libraries. And for purposes of this discussion, I'm going to focus on uh, teen spaces because so often I hear from directors of small libraries and staff from small libraries that, oh, if only we had a teen space. So a, a few years ago, I did a presentation all about teen spaces, and I gathered photographs and information from a variety of size libraries here in Iowa. This is a teen space uh, from the, as you see, Drake Community Library. They spent $65,000 to renovate a teen space. This was part of their new building. And that 565 square feet is not the size of their library. That's the size of the teen space. So obviously, this is a larger library. Now, what could you do if you're a small library and you see this and you think, oh, they're a big library, they've got all the nice stuff and we can't do that. We're getting rid of the word can't, remember? So what could you do for your library looking at this teen space? And Catherine, if you'll contact me, I'll have my contact information later. I can certainly send you some of that information about teen spaces, yeah. Oops, didn't want to advance yet. What can you take from this picture and implement into a small setting? Anybody? Some of the furniture, the flooring, yeah. A dedicated computer, implementing that booth seating, the colors. And is that uh, Katie? I think maybe you looked at my next slide here. <laughs> this is an example of adopting the color scheme. Now, I don't think this library copied off of the Drake Community Library, but you can see there's some similarities. This is a much smaller space, 169 square feet, and a much lower price tag. 
And Vivian, you're so right that paint isn't too expensive and definitely marks off an area, as does a rug. And you can see that from this picture. A rug can really make a difference. Here's another example of a team space. This one's a little more um, busy. But the neat thing about this one, you can see it wasn't very expensive. And they got their community involved because the local art teacher did the mural on the back wall and local art students made the mosaic table. So I thought that was really a good idea that they implemented some work from the community and got some buy-in even from the teens. This is from, again, Waukee, the library that did the do-it-yourself story time. And this is a mid-sized library and they, they have a decent budget. It's not huge, but it's decent. But money's still tight when it comes to implementing redecorations and things like that. And this was such a cool idea that the uh, then new services librarian did. She just got some donated ceiling tiles from a lo uh, local contractor, bought the tempura paints, and let the teens each paint a tile. And then our local public works department went, and I was the director there, that's why I say our, um, local public works director um, got some of the guys together to put these ceiling tiles in place for us. So the total cost was around, I think at that time it was about $30. Uh, in increases in pricing now is probably about $50. So that's a really cool idea that I think even a small library would be able to implement. Here's another example for you from a tiny library. They renovated and wanted to put in a teen space but just didn't have the room because they couldn't increase the size of the square footage. But what they did was they took their shelving and put it on wheels and made walls, if you will, out of that shelving to carve out this little corner that they use for their teen area. And then whenever they want to do some programming, they simply unlock those wheels and push them out of the way and it opens up the space. So let's move on now to maker spaces. Um, that's not such a new word anymore, but it's a newer word in library land. And most of us, when we think of maker space, we think of something like this from the Cincinnati Public Library, a, a big room and high-tech equipment, big equipment and 3D printers and expensive equipment. But that's not necessarily what's needed for a maker space. In fact, there's a, uh, this is like a blog that's available online still, at least it was a week ago when I checked. It's all about making, uh, the title is How to Make a $100 Maker Space for Your Library. And these are some of the tips that the author offers. She says, when it comes to creating a maker space, lots of amounts of creativity can easily overcome not having large amounts of money. With proper mindset, even a ream of office paper can provide a library makerspace with endless possibilities. She talks about uh, embracing the limitless creative potential in everyday objects. Think junk, and I'll touch more on that in just a minute. And she adds that the maker movement is, more, uh, is about more than technology. Don't feel like you need iPads or laptops or 3D printers to create a successful makerspace. I often tell small libraries, if you're doing a knitting program at your library, and that's pretty popular in a lot of libraries now, and you have those knitters over in the corner of your library. At that moment, that corner of your library has become a makerspace. So don't think that makerspace means big, fancy, expensive technology. It may just mean some knitting needles. This author also recommends to buy the essential things such as scissors and duct tape and to focus on buying a lot for a little. Um, she talks about the LED lights that she gets for almost nothing, 100 in a package for around $3. From that same article, she adds that creating a library makerspace is a marathon, not a sprint. It will take time to build an awareness in your community about what a makerspace is and why people should use it. And I will have to say this is true regardless of the size of your library because I know of a large library in my area that implemented a fantastic makerspace, state-of-the-art stuff, and they had to work to get their community to actually realize it was there and to adopt it and to start using it. She adds that the single most important element of makerspace is community. Talk to the people about what they make, how they make it, and most important, why they make it. One of the directors who was an original presenter of this uh, webinar, she said this kind of in passing at one of our county meetings, and I love what she said, and I have quoted her on numerous occasions, because in many ways she's absolutely right. So we have to ask the question, how much space does a makerspace take if a makerspace could take space? And what would be your answer? How much space do you need for a makerspace? See, some of you are mentioning IKEA as options for inexpensive furnishings. And Sandy gets the prize <laughs> if we had a virtual prize. How much space does it take? A table. You are so right. 
Uh, this is a makerspace in one of the small libraries in my district, and the director wrote this note. The response has been outstanding. I just want to encourage other smaller libraries not to be too intimidated by the idea of a makerspace, and remember it can be any size and include all kinds of things. So what this librarian did was, in addition to making this designated table, and here's a picture of this library, it is small, you can see not only in the population it serves, but also in its square footage. But the director took this shelf, which formerly housed reference materials, which were no longer being used because most of her reference materials now are online, and she turned it into a makerspace shelf and bought these various kits and put them in a box. Some of the things that not only she, but several other librarians who have done similar things, highly recommend as things you may want to include in a makerspace are these magnet tiles. There's also a light table that you can order if you have the space for it and the finances, but they've said that even without the light table, the magnet tiles still work quite well. Circuit sets are another thing that they recommend utilizing. And then something new that this Prairie City Public Library recently implemented is something called learning kits, adult learning kits. These are simply tote bags that have sets of information in them to help people learn new skills or do new activities. For instance, they have uh, Frisbee golf, disc golf, they have yoga set, they have a cake decorating set. And a really neat story about this, about ways that small libraries are serving their populations and making a difference is this one about uh, one of the particular learning kits here. They have a ukulele set, which includes an actual ukulele and a method book and I think a video, how-to video. And there was a teen girl in this community who was planning to buy her own ukulele and her mom learned that the library had a set and told the daughter, hey, don't spend your money, go check out the one from the library first and see if you like it. So the girl did that, loved the ukulele, learned how to play it by using the library's resources, then went and bought her own. She started playing at the local farmer's market and a couple of her friends were interested. So they went to the library, checked out the set, learned how to play ukulele, and then bought their own and joined her. And they now have formed a little group that they call Ukes for Cancer. And they perform regularly at their local farmer's market and this photograph, I believe, was taken when they performed at the countywide relay for race. So what a cool story, I think, of, of a tremendous way that the library made a difference for the whole community by making a difference in the lives of these girls by providing this very simple and not too expensive set. So size is relative, not potential. This, again, is a quote from one of my directors. And um, I definitely have to say this as we were warming up here, getting ready to start this webinar today, we asked you, what's the size of your library? And I think most of you knew this webinar was targeted for small libraries. And I saw different sizes, everything from just under 800 to over 10,000. So those of you in the 10,000 are going, yeah, I'm a small library. And those of you at 800 going, oh, you don't know what small is. So size is definitely relative but it doesn't have to spell out your potential. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Slater Library. This is where the director said that a makerspace is just a fancy name for a craft space. And I love what she has on her website. I don't usually put so much text on a screen, but I wanted you to be able to see this. She talks about small libraries can either pass off their roles to the larger libraries in the, the metro areas, or they can strive to find ways to provide full service to their patrons where they live. And she goes on to add more to this. Um, I would encourage you to look at what she has posted on their website because it really is a, a true uh, encouragement to small libraries. But here are some things that she does. She utilizes these story time centers. And you can see from the various photos that some of the equipment she's using for these, they're very interactive. They're keeping the kids entertained. A lot of hand-eye coordination, fine motor skills but they're inexpensive, like the photo on the top left is just nuts and bolts. And then the uh, second from the right top, those are pool noodles. And the bottom right, those are old, um, like toilet paper rolls off the giant toilet paper, industrial sized toilet paper rolls. And they're using that as a marble shoot. So pretty cool. She also implemented a tween reading program and partnered with the local historical society to do that. And now in its, I believe, fourth year, that has gone countywide into a tween reading program. So every year she chooses a book and the entire county participates and they've been getting uh, growing crowds for that. This is a picture of the main area of her library. Very welcoming, very pretty. 
but they don't have a, a large meeting room or meeting area. So what they do is once a month, they clear out this furniture and they bring out some tables to create their maker space. They have card making materials that they have in tins, uh, tubs rather, and they do a card making program, which is uh, very much appreciated by the community. Another thing that this library does with that same space, just by maneuvering the furniture around, is they do something called the soup and sound lunch. They started doing this when the local organization that was furnishing seniors with lunch was no longer able to do that. So the staff brings in crock pots of soup and they invite local people, oftentimes students or uh, older people from the community who play an instrument, to come in and to perform a little music while the seniors have their soup and socialization time. I just think that's such a cool program. This is her example of her maker space with the Lego sets and I included this just so you could see how she catalogs them. Another one of those original presenters says, you don't have to be big to think big. And again, I think that is so true. She does a lot of outreach to senior facilities, which um, there are several of these in her community. So three of the programs that they do, first is Books on a Cart. This is where the librarian chooses books, sends them off with a volunteer with a small book cart who goes up and down the hallways and stops to visit with the uh, residents of the senior facility and offers them books from the library. The shared bookcase is where there's a permanent bookcase inside the senior facility. A librarian chooses books and a volunteer goes and swaps them out, I think on a monthly basis. And then the Memory Makers program, that's kind of like an adult, uh, adult storytelling that they do this, I believe, specifically with an Alzheimer's unit. Uh, the librarian chooses a theme, has a short story to go with that theme, and then asks questions and talks about memory. So for example, you might talk about your first car, or how did you celebrate Christmas as a kid, or uh, what do you remember about your school days, those types of things. So that's a, a really neat program, I think. Her tips were to ask for what you need. She says her community is so willing to provide if they know what you need. And then she encourages librarians to recycle. Um, I would say that having a wish tree at certain times of year can be a nice little way you can just tie some little tags on some type of a tree, whether that's a more of an evergreen kind of tree or a twig tree. Uh, you could even do it as a bulletin board display. You could also post a list like on a big chalkboard and have things listed that you need or have an obvious designated area then to collect those items um, once you post what you need and that kind of brings attention to it as well. We mentioned something about recycling earlier and I was talking about using junk for maker spaces. This is an example, two examples of different programs this librarian does. Um, they get, she asks the local uh, contractors, plumbers and electricians to save some of their scraps and then uses those to make the trash robots. And then she also has a farmer who grows these gourds and smaller pumpkins for her and donates those to the library every year. And they just use junk pieces to be able to uh, create what she calls pumpkin junkin. Here's another idea from a small library. This one has a population of 1,500. Um, the neat thing about this is this director says, and this is her quote, this is an idea that likely cannot be done in a bigger library or city. So this is specifically for small libraries. And the other neat thing about this is she adopted this from a very large multi-branch system and took that idea and narrowed it down, brought it down for her small library. This was back when the summer reading theme was about uh, superheroes, but I think you could think of this uh, hero concept any time of year. And what she did was she had nominations on a weekly basis, had forms that people could fill out to recognize some of the people in the community who usually didn't get recognition, who were doing great things. And it might have been, oh, the, the neighborhood team who went around and raked leaves for elderly people. And then that person would be highlighted and receive a, a sign like you see here to be placed in their yard. This is one of the tiniest libraries in my district. Um, you can see the population is less than 400 and very small square footage, but they've done some interesting and very creative programming. This uh, ugly sweater contest was done as a fundraiser, actually, and they charged, I don't remember, 50 cents, I think, a ticket. People came and voted for those. Uh, you can see on these pictures that they regularly do community fun nights, and the top two pictures are actually in this small library. And yes, it's cramped, but it brings the community together. They didn't, then did an off-site program for one of them with the ice cream social that you see down at the bottom. That was just a, at a nearby community center. 
this library has um, collaborated with other libraries in the county. There are six libraries in this community, in this county rather, and most all of them are very tiny of under a thousand uh, uh, population. And some of the things that they've done is, and they do this every year and have done it for several years, every year they do a toddler fest and not only get together themselves to produce a lot of the activities, but partner with area and countywide uh, different resources and locations that also support preschool and toddler activities. And it's a huge event. They also do a movie showing every year for the teens countywide. Uh, one of the movie theaters allows the teens to come in and see the movie that's based on a book just before it's aired to the general public. They also do a countywide read program. Again, this is just from collaborating together, which is a wonderful way for small libraries to uh, get a little more bang for the buck, if you will, that they can make big differences, big impacts in a broader setting than what they might be able to do on their own. Okay, now it's your turn to think. Here's a big library idea. Cafes. So many large libraries have these and small library staff go into them and go, oh, this is so nice. I wish we could do this at my library. How can you implement a library cafe in a small library environment? Wait for you to type here in the chat box. A hot pot with boxes of tea. Good, says Karen. Get the Keurig maker going. Looks like a couple of you do that. Coffee Fridays with coffee, tea, and a flesh, special flavor of cream. Use a small cart. Yeah, if you've got a leftover, unused, flat top book cart, they make great coffee carts. Run it by volunteers. Oh, nice, you have a local coffee shop that drops in some coffee. It's interesting that some of you have mentioned local coffee shops. Uh, some of my libraries, their local coffee shop or cafe has closed. And so the library realized there was a need, especially for seniors who would go there and that was their socialization time. So the library now creates their own coffee cafe once a week and a lot of seniors come and, and participate. Other libraries have done like you're saying, either uh, use a cart and have it available in the corner of the library, get the Keurig. Oh, and Amy is uh, talking about coffee with a cop. That's a great program. Here's another um, test for you. This was something we did at that summer reading program training that I mentioned at the beginning of this session. Uh, this was all about having a beach ball and you would write questions on it. You would throw the beach ball to each other. And when you caught the beach ball, you looked down on it and whatever question was there, that's what you got asked and had answered. And we had small libraries say, oh, there's no way we could do this. We don't have the space to throw a ball around like this. How could you take this idea and use it in a small library environment? Graffiti wall, hmm. Not sure about that, what you mean by that. Draw questions from a hat, yeah. Put them on index cards and pass the deck around. Put the questions in a jar. Folded paper game. Yeah, put it on a piece of paper and just toss a, a paper wad instead. See, it's not so difficult, is it? Okay, here's one more for you. Author visits. Author visits often require more space because you're anticipating larger crowds. They're often extremely expensive. How can you have an author visit in a small library? Utilize local authors. Absolutely, Chelsea. Skype. Skype is your friend when it comes to author visits. Partner with the local school. Great idea. Um, I've heard of libraries just utilizing some online recordings of the authors who are talking about their book and then presenting those in a special uh, book discussion. If you have access to the database uh, books and authors, contemporary authors have their contact information readily listed there so that you can contact them and maybe, maybe even just by email that you can communicate with them and ask them the questions that the people in your local book group are discussing about the, that author's work 
or contact them and say, would you be willing to Skype with us and do a presentation? Good ideas. Okay, just a few resources here and then we're going to wrap things up. Uh, the first one is from ALA and ALS. They have this site with a lot of kickstart, they call them, ideas. One of the ideas here, I'm gonna have you brainstorm again, is all about uh, horses. It's called Bits and Bridle. And this is what it recommends. Not much, so you have to get creative. It says, discuss a great horse book and complement it with fun horse-related activities. What can you do with a horse in a small library environment? Horses are big. <laughs> Use a stick horse. Yeah, great idea. Oh, pin the tail on the horse. I like that. Go outside, yes. Somebody's asking, what is a horse snack? Well, maybe horse-shaped cookies. I don't know. Use the doll models. Oh, painting ceramic horses. Good. I had thought that maybe you could take um, a sawhorse and put it over in a corner of the library and have somebody who owns horses bring in some of the tack and put the saddle and everything on and explain how that's used. And then maybe you could do some photo ops and take pictures of the kids on the sawhorse on a real saddle. Samantha mentioned ARSL earlier, and if you're not a member of this, this can be a great resource for small and rural libraries. They have an annual conference, and they also have a listserv, so it's a great way to share ideas and questions with other library staff from small libraries. The programming library, right here, they have a tab, maybe you haven't explored their website, but they have a tab about browse ideas up there in the left corner, and once you click on that, a drop-down comes and asks you, you can limit even more by budget, by library type, popular topic, and audience. So that's a wonderful resource. Finally, the internet, or not finally, but another one is um, the internet. If you Google small public library ideas, you will get so many ideas. You'll be overwhelmed, information overload. A lot of these ideas will come from Pinterest. I don't personally have a Pinterest account, but I'm told it has wonderful resources. So um, again, you'll probably have information overload if you do that, but some wonderful resources available there. We encourage our libraries to look from water tower to water tower. Being in small rural areas, those water towers are typically about 10 miles apart. So partner with your colleagues. Remember what I told you about the Green County librarians, that they, the six of them partner together and do wonderful countywide things, um, whether that's by county or region, just the next town over, or some similar agencies, whether that's a school or a museum that's in your area, children's museum. Um, your state library, look to them for resources and they have consultation, I'm sure, so they can provide you with some information and some guidance. If you're like our state library, you have probably have some kind of statewide communication system available. And continuing education, ask them, can we do something about programming in small libraries? And that takes us to question and answer time. So, Samantha, did I miss questions? I know I couldn't keep up with the chat the whole time. Um, it looks like you did a pretty good job of keeping up with chat, and ones that you didn't, uh, weren't able to answer, the collective brain answered. <laughs> oh, Out of curiosity, what kinds of questions um, were shared on there for others that may have missed them as they sped by? So one question that came really early up was, um, do you do background checks on volunteers? Oh, I do recall seeing that, and I, I didn't get to answer that. Um, that's an interesting question. Our, I would say check with your state law library and check with your local police because our law librarian um, has some pretty good information for libraries about that, that we right away tend to think, oh yes, we should definitely have to do background checks, but she warns about them because they can be misleading. Um, sometimes they will only give you information about for example, I live in Iowa, so we might get a background check on them in Iowa and they might be clean, but they may have moved here from some other state where they had a whole record listed and you might miss that information depending on the kind of background check you do. Um, so check with your state law library before you implement background checks. And then of course you'd want to check with your um, local laws and city policies as well. Anybody else? Um, another question that came through, um, more of a request for you to speak on, is uh, Barbara says that they have some people who think the small library should join into a large library. Uh, she disagrees and is wondering if you could speak to that. 
that's an interesting question, Barbara, because that's something that's been discussed in our area. Um, we certainly realize the, the vitality and the importance importance of keeping a physical library in a small community. So anytime that we talk about uh, collaboration or a merger, it doesn't mean that we want to get rid of those individual libraries in those communities. But with money tightening more and more in, in cities, uh, especially here in Iowa, we've had some tax setbacks. Um, we can see the advantage of libraries partnering definitely partnering and possibly joining forces in order to get the larger equipment such as uh, an um, uh, automation system. And we do have some libraries that have done that in our state where they form consortia and they've been able to get much more, as I said earlier, bang for the buck by collaborating and putting their resources together that way. Um, but I do understand, Barbara, that yeah, those small physical facilities in those communities are vitally important. So hopefully I answered your question. It's great. Um, one other question that came through the chat uh, quite a while ago is, do you need a food license in order to have food? Oh, you would have to check with your, I would say your city, your county, your state on that. Um, again, your local state law library can probably help with that because I know those laws vary and I am not um, an attorney. And as you know, librarians never give legal advice. <laughs> we just give information. So my information for you is to contact your local city, county um, health departments and inquire about that. I think part of it has to do is if you're, you're cooking, you may, or if things are supposed to be refrigerated, I think there are different laws about that. If you're serving a packaged food that you've you know, picked up granola bars or something, I don't believe you have to. But again, I'm not an attorney, so you would need to contact your uh, local health departments and appropriate organizations that could answer that for you. Great. Uh, Melanie is wondering if you have any um, program ideas that can be replicated for on the road. Well, uh, at one point in my career, I was an outreach services librarian and did all of my story times on the road. And so I, I had to learn to how to package things that I could still take flannel boards and magnet boards and puppets and things like that uh, and got very creative. And in fact, I just shared this yesterday and I, I did have it here by my desk, but I've already put it away. I got a, a big whiteboard that was magnetic and on the back of it glued a cookie sheet so that I could put my magnet pieces on the back that I could see them as I held this up and then I could just pull those pieces out and put them on the front. And that was a very um, concise and easy to carry way to take a, a, what might normally be used in a larger setting. Uh, we have a lot of libraries in this area that are getting book uh, bicycles because we have so many recreation trails here in Iowa, particularly in central Iowa. And many of these libraries are located close to those trails. So instead of getting a bookmobile, which they could never afford to do, they're getting a bike mobile. And they get these bicycles that they have the uh, special trailers on the back and they can put bicycle um, books inside that, ride the bicycle to area parks during the ball games or um, to just do a story time in the park. And they can actually check out materials depending on your um, ILS system that you have. So that's kind of a cool thing. I think a lot of things can be done on the road. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, packaging it. Even book discussions can be done on the road easily. Now, that doesn't require anything other than to take the books. So maybe some of you have things to talk about here. One other well, question. Oh. I was just going to comment that somebody's off. partnering with the local food bank uh, for prepackaged after school snacks. That's a great idea. Samantha, did you have another question there that I missed? Uh, yeah, one of the other questions that came up was how to get people to come. Uh, um, you have to know your audience. You have to be presenting good quality presentations to give them a reason to want to come. And you have to let them know that you're doing this because if nobody knows about it, it could be the greatest program in the world. But um, if it was buried under a rock, people just won't know. So. Uh, I was a teen specialist librarian at one point in time and was told to basically start a teen program from scratch. Um, I had zero budget too, by the way, and this was in a very large library system. 
But the primary thing I did, two things I did that led to a huge success of this was one, I got to know the names of the teens. And two, I put those signs and posters and flyers and pamphlets everywhere. And in fact, somebody told me, I see these teen program things all over town. Um, so that was my goal, was to get the word out. Um, uh, if you can partner with the school and actually develop a relationship with the school, that you're going to the school maybe on a regular basis and meeting the students, I think that's helpful so that they know who you are, you know who they are. Um, if you develop a partnership with maybe some of your adult groups that are in town, whether that's, uh, oh, most towns have a women's club or maybe there's a quilting group or a Kiwanis or a Rotary, depending on the size of your community, partner with them and see what types of programming either you could do for them or in many cases, what they could do for you. Most small towns still have a VFW and contact them and say, hey, we've got Veterans Day coming up and we'd really love to have you come to the library. Would you be willing to do a presentation about whatever war they served in? And I think that's a good way to get your community involved and to pretty much guarantee you're going to get an audience because that person's family and friends and neighbors are going to come. And uh, it, maybe it's a little um, selfish, <laughs> it sounds like, but it's a good way to guarantee some, some attendance. And it also um, is a good way to get to know your community, I think. Yeah, social media, don't underestimate that. That's free ways to advertise, definitely. Uh, talking about social media, I will say most libraries tend to go with Facebook, which is great. But one of my librarians recently said, uh, because she was lamenting that she couldn't reach the 20s and 30s uh, year old people. And she said she switched to um, Instagram. Uh, she retained her Facebook, but added uh, Instagram. And she said, oh my goodness, I'm getting all these 20 and 30 somethings and they're coming to the library and it's all happening because of Instagram. So consider that as a publicity aspect. And I know in small libraries, publicity is sometimes hard because you have limited time, you have limited staff, maybe you have limited abilities. Um, I will say that you can create some pretty attractive signs about your programs by using a, um, a PowerPoint slide. Take a PowerPoint slide, create your graphic on there about your program. Remember to keep it simple. You don't want a lot of text. You want the good details and you want an, an eye-catching graphic. Put your library logo and name and, and information on there. Save that as a photograph and then you can post that on Facebook quite easily and or print it out and use it as a poster. And um, Bethany's talking about Canva, and yes, that's another really good resource that a lot of people find that extremely easy to use. I see Tanya's talking about using an escape room for the 20s and 30s. If you're trying to reach the 20s and 30s crowd, some of the things that I think have proven useful are to do after hours programs. Um, that's just kind of a cool thing. And uh, Sometimes having a, a wine or beer element there, whether that's a wine tasting or a beer tasting, can be um, a good way to attract that crowd. Check with your local city ordinances about that. Um, also your policies at your library. Doing off-site programming at a local pub is another good way to reach that age group. I keep telling people to do an adult Lego club. I think that would be successful with that particular age group because um, that kind of ties in with that whole word of fandom, which is where you have groups of people who love to do something and they think they're the only one. And adult coloring is an example that I think there are a lot of people that used to color in the closet and didn't know there was a whole other group of people that loved it as well until libraries started offering these adult coloring programs. And I think Legos are the same way or Lego. My, my son, who is about 30, is a big Lego fan. He always tells me they're not Legos, they're Lego. <laughs> There's no S on it. Um, but he would love that if a library would offer that in his area. Oh, somebody's doing that, an adult Lego challenge. I'm so glad to hear you're doing that. Great, board games too. Yeah, but not just any old board games. Get some of those really cool newer board games. Um, and, and there again, you probably have people in your community who's, uh, who are doing these things. Talk with them and say, would you be willing to kind of help coordinate and lead this? When I was a teen librarian, I did a hugely successful electronic gaming program. I didn't play electronic games. I didn't know one from another. And in fact, um, one of the presentations I gave at the Internet Librarian was titled, How to Do a Gaming Program When You Can't Tell an Xbox from a GameCube. 
Um, so, and it was successful because I relied on my teens who did know about video games uh, and, and they let it. They just ran with it and they loved that opportunity to kind of be in charge. It gave them some leadership opportunities. Somebody's mentioning Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, that's popular, especially with that 20s and 30s crowd. And we, um, Rochelle was wondering if you have any um, recommendations for how to get ukuleles donated. Oh, wow. Well, um, I would say go to a local music store first. And if they can't actually donate them, they might be able to cut you a good deal. Be sure to tell them that you would definitely give them some good publicity credit um, in your signage and in your marketing of the materials that these donated in part by such and such music store. That's where I would go first. Other than that, maybe if someone plays a ukulele in your area who is avid about it, they might be willing to make a donation to see it furthered. Another question that we had a little while ago uh, was um, one person found that their educational programs don't do nearly as well as craft programs and they're mm. wondering how to get more people interested in attending their educational programs. I had this exact same question asked at a recent gathering. Um, I said a lot of times it's in the publicity. If your publicity sounds boring, <laughs> People don't want to come. And sadly, I've seen far too many promotionals about educational programs that just sound boring. You know, come and sit through this lecture. Oh, I don't want to do that. So you've got to find a way to spice up your marketing, um, make it a little snazzier. Just as an example, the first one that pops in my head, um, I did database training. And that's a pretty snoozer of a program, right? Most people aren't going to go to a database training session at the library. Well, I did it around February, and my publicity said, date a what? D-A-T-E. Date a what? Just database. And, and kind of played it up on that, so it made it sound a little more fun and exciting. Um, and just, again, using that same example, databases are searching the deep web. So if you tell people come to this database program and learn how to use the library's resources. Oh my goodness, no, you're not going to get anybody. But if you say, want to know how to search the deep web? Come here and we'll show you. We'll go diving into the deep web. You know, that's just totally different. Ooh, that kind of piques your curiosity, right? I want to know how to do the deep web. So think about your publicity, definitely. And then get to know your public. What are they interested in? Maybe you're interested in rocks, but nobody else in the community is. And so you did this educational program about rocks and it failed. Maybe they're more interested in trees. So, you know, do a program on trees instead. I will say that as far as educational, gardening programs are a hot topic, it seems, right now. And cooking. Gardening and cooking. I don't think you can go wrong with either one of those. I see somebody's mentioning about um, homeschool families. Absolutely. That's one group that you can say, this is highly educational, and they'll show up. Whereas uh, the opposite may be true. If you tell them, oh, this is going to be fun and games, they'll say, we don't have time for that. Um, and I can speak from experience. I'm a former homeschool parent. Uh, so definitely, if you have homeschoolers in your area, tap into that resource. Somebody's saying that, um, Kristen is saying that local history and genealogy are guaranteed for them as well. Yeah, that's usually... Usually you're fairly safe with that as well. Michelle's mentioning grants. Um, yeah, check on what grants are available in your area. Sadly, some of those grantors, you have to have that business within so many miles of your community. And a lot of our communities don't qualify because there's nothing for miles around. But do see what's available if you've got any businesses. Um, in our area, probably, I think um, Casey's, I believe, has some grants. Casey's is a gas station in this part of the country. And um, most, even most of our small towns have a Casey's nearby. So. Great. 
and it looks like we are pretty much out of time. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to you, Marianne, uh, for this presentation. And of course, everyone who uh, made time to attend today. Um, thank you all. Uh, this webinar is going to be available on programminglibrarian.org within the next 24 hours in case you would like to watch it again or share it out. Thank you. There's my contact information. So just file, a, uh, shoot an email my way, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have afterwards. Thanks, everyone.